this is what I learned about the Eagles, Tony. They can beat you in so many different ways. Ooh, it's a glorious Tuesday, NFC East fans. And if you're a Philadelphia sports fan, it's a big Tuesday, Tones of Shields. Because the Phillies start the NLCS today. Once again, my name is Jeff Kerr, host of Good Morning NFC East. And I got my man, Tony Shields. He's repping the Sixers today. I love that because the Sixers start tonight, too. I probably should have wore my Sixers hat with you, Tony. I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> hey, listen, man. Philly sports is on cloud nine right now. Uh, Phillies are doing great. You know, they have to keep the momentum. That's going to be the that's going to be the tough part. You know, they have their work cut out. They have their work cut off one. But I think the pie, I think I think with the Phillies and I know this is a, a football show. Right. But really quickly, I think the Phillies are starting to get the uh, the luck of the matchups. I think I would prefer the Phillies going up against the Padres rather than the Dodgers. You know what I mean? Yeah, I would have I would have preferred, you know, them going up against um, Louisville rather than. Uh, who was it, the Mets early on or the or the Braves? Well, whatever it was, their matchups have been working out for them, in a, you know, throughout this playoff process. Well, yeah, it feels like 2008 in a sense, right? You know, you know the Red Sox were the better team in the World Series, but you didn't get them. You got the Rays, and it's like, oh, okay, like like this might happen now. Yeah, it, 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 you're right, Tone. It's, it's almost like in the football playoffs. Like, you know, it, we're going to be like this probably in two months with the Eagles. It's like, it's okay. Which team do you want the Eagles to face in the divisional round? You know, do you, do you want them to be, do you want them to face the seventh, the the lowest seed possible, the seventh seed, or do you, do you want the you just want to go chalk and have them play the four seed or the five seed? And we'll get into that. Uh, but I wanted to talk about one thing. And look, I I do this column every week for CBS Sports. You should read it. This is what happens when you cover the league. You have to watch every single game, or at least get, you know most of every single game. I will say that I right. usually watch. The, the hour, hour, 30 minutes. So I did that yesterday. I bunkered down after I finally got some sleep. <laughs> and what I did was I wrote one thing I learned about each team this past week. And we'll start with the Eagles here. This is what I learned about the Eagles. So they can beat you in so many different ways. And it's hard to find a new thing every single week. But I feel like that drive against the Cowboys, when it was 20 to 17, and you have a 13 play, 77 yard drive where Jalen Hurts goes down the field, three for three for 30 yards, gets two first downs with his legs. That's a back breaking drive, Tone. Most definitely. And it kind of resembles uh, that final drive against the Arizona Cardinals. The only difference is they actually finished the deal with the touchdown. And Jalen Hurts has been touching on this, right? He's been touching on the fact that they've been leaving a lot of money on the table. They haven't been taking full advantage of every opportunity. They have still yet to play a, a complete game of football. You know, they still have, you know, those spots in the third quarter where they go flat and then they, you know, revive themselves. I think what they need to do in order to try to, I guess, keep momentum or just stay the course, lean more into the running game. A lot of running game to be your, your motivator or your driver going into the second half, especially if you have a lead. But just continue to do what you do best. I think what they end up doing is when they get a lead, sometimes they get a little too pass happy. Sometimes they start games a little too pass happy, and they don't lean into what they do best. And I think I think I think they always come out of halftime out of rhythm, out of sync a little bit because maybe the play call and sequencing is a little off. But regardless of all that, though, you brought up a very good point. They are learning to win in so many different ways. And it's hard to win in the NFL. It's even harder to learn how to win because it takes a village. It takes all 53 guys on the roster. It takes your, your entire coaching staff. And those in those unique moments where teams or coaches have to make those decisions, it could either be the challenge of play, like Mike, like Mike McCarthy didn't do, right? It's all about those moments. It's all about what do you do when this is the drive you have to have. And Jalen Hurts has come through in that. Nick Sirianni has shown a propensity to remain even kill, even though he's a fiery guy. When it comes to his decision making, it doesn't seem to uh, reflect how fiery he can be. You know, he's he's pretty he's he he he's pretty uh, proactive instead of reactive. So again, this coaching staff is doing a great job preparing these guys. Jalen Hurts is also doing an amazing job keeping his team focused on the task at hand and. They can beat you in so many different ways. You've seen it from top to bottom, from the beginning up until now. Doesn't it feel like the Eagles – and, again, we talked about this before 
when this show was in its infancy, before this, the show we even started, and right. first three six five too, it's the Eagles okay. want to be this passing team. I don't actually think they're as good as a running team this year as they were last year, but that's not a bad thing because they can still run the football. It's just I, I, I it's we're not seeing the. I guess you could say the big runs. They're not averaging five and a half yards per carry like they were last year. So I think it's like 4.8 or something like that. It's still good. Like, they're still a top five rushing offense. They can beat you anytime time running the football. But doesn't it feel like they're they're not as efficient as a running team? Or uh, no, efficiency is not the right word. They're not as good, that it, but they're still efficient. You know, when you, put it for, when you put it in that perspective, right, five and a half yards per carry is absurd when you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we were just spoiled by you know <laughs> that you know that rushing output last year and granted you know the circumstances were very different you know now we're now we're sort of running with intentionality uh to set up the pass and you know there's you know you know uh, there's the the play calling is improved i think last year you know we struggled with passing the ball and they had they had to lean so far into the running game they had to make sure it was the best thing they did. They, it had to work. You know, this year they can afford, a, a, you know, a bad job or two running the ball and then, you know, get back to the passing game. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm not too, I'm not too stressed about it because they're still averaging over four and a half yards per carry. Like I said, five, averaging over five yards per carry uh, for a season when you're running the ball is absurd. So I think we were just spoiled from that last year, if I'm being completely honest. Yeah, I, I would agree with you there, Tony. I, so, since I had to do every team, let's go to the Giants now. Um, right. Five and one. Again, still amazed that they are five and one. They already got more wins than last year. But this is what I learned. And is this a hot take? I'm not a hot take guy, but you have to consider this year. And keep in mind the Eagles are in this division. Yet yeah, alone the entire NFL. The Giants might have the best coaching staff in the NFL. If you think about it, mm-hmm. Brian Dable, he's the innovator. He's the guy keeping everybody afoot. Mike Kafka, again, unproven, but he's a creative play caller. They're getting the most out of what they have. And Wink Martindale was already one of the best defensive coaches in the league, and you see what he's doing with that defense. And I'm just going by those three, uh, you know, top three. If you had to rank, like, your offense coordinator, your defensive coordinator, and your head coach, I mean, the Bruce in the pudding toe. The Giants are 5-1. and one. They still have Daniel Jones. They still have the bad offensive line. Yes, Saquon Barkley's healthy, but they got no wide receivers. They got no cornerbacks. They got so many issues, but yet they're beating teams every single week and they're finding ways to do it. Yeah, the Giants are interesting because you clearly you clearly see there's a limit to their style of football. You know, you you clearly see that it has a, it has a, it has a, a limitation. It has a cap, but what they've been doing is they've been having to give every team they've played their best shot. And they've been having to outsmart, outcoach, outmaneuver the opponent. They've had to be more opportunistic than the opponent. They're not really winning these games based off talent. They're winning these games based off of high-level coaching, high-level decision-making, and sticking to who they are and living by the sword. You know what I mean? They know who they are. They're sticking to it. And I respect the team that knows who they are more than a team that continues to try to do things they know they're not really capable of. The Chicago Bears, they stick to the team to have Justin Fields dropping back like he's paying Manny or something, or that they're not scheming for his skill set. They haven't created anything for his skill set. The Eagles, on the other hand, Giants, on the other hand, they've created schemes. They've created an offensive identity that's centered around their top-tier talent, centered around their quarterbacks for the most part. Dayball's not putting – Daniel Jones have compromising positions. You know, he's not asking he's not asking Daniel Jones to throw the ball 40 times, 30 plus times a game. No. They're leaning on the running game. They're playing good defense. And Daniel Jones is being asked to make a good throw here and there. Yeah, and they're relying on other teams to make mistakes too. Like Green Bay made a ton of, they had a ton of mistakes two weeks ago. Baltimore. It, they're opportunistic. They're, they're opportunistic. You can you, you exactly. that's the, that's a great brand football to play, being opportunistic. Yeah, it's smart by that. So yeah, I mean, when you look at why the Giants are five and one, if you watch their games, you can see why. It, it, it's like, like you said, Tony, they're very opportunistic. They don't fold under pressure, and for a rookie head coach 
That's impressive. Uh, now we got to get into the Cowboys because the Eagles mm-hmm. did beat them Sunday night. And I kind of used Michael Parsons in this one. When the, Michael Parsons faced a good offensive line, he wasn't Micah Parsons. He was mm-hmm. average. Michael Parsons is not an average football player. He's a top three football player. But when he faced an actual challenge, he can be stopped. Oh, yeah, most definitely. And, you know, the, the good thing about him is or the good thing about his prospects this season is the fact that every team doesn't have Lane Johnson. So he's yeah. going to be able he's, he's going to be able to feast on most offensive lines in his NFL. That's the thing. He's going to be able to do his thing for the most part. But when you go up against those stout offensive lines like the Philadelphia Eagles have man, like they're going to go up against in Detroit. I understand Detroit's losing right now, but Detroit got embarrassed last week. Uh, they're coming off of a very, very, very bad stretch. And they have a pretty stout offensive line as well, one of the best. Um, they just had to put it together, and, and they, their defense has been bad. But, you know, the Cowboys, you know, like you said, you saw Michael Parsons become a non-factor. See, what they did was they had Michael Parsons – they forced Michael Parsons to make a decision on every single play. He couldn't just pin his ears back and, and, do, and do his job. He was forced to think – Two, two, three, maybe four extra times. You know, they put him. They put him in situations where whatever decision he made, they took advantage of. And then you saw when Lane Johnson went down, they took advantage of Jack Driscoll. And I can't get mad at Jack Driscoll. He did the best he could. But the Cowboys, they, I still think they're a good team. I think I, I still think they're a good team. But they're another team that I feel that I think their defense is better than their offense. I, I, I don't think Dak Prescott will never be a hundred percent this season. And I think as the season goes on, even after he comes back, I think I think he's going to have limitations on the throws that he can make. I just think that defense still is going to be their driving force. If the Cowboys are smart, they're going to continue the same game plan as it was with Cooper Rush. This was the similar game plan when Dak got in, his, in Dak's first year, right? Lean on the running game, play good defense, and ask your quarterback to throw the ball 25 to 30 times. What upset me was – and. And again, Eagles fans, they probably will not agree with me on this, but apparently they got mad at Collinsworth uh, on Sunday night salving over Parsons, saying he can play this, he can play defensive end, he can play linebacker, he can play cornerback. They're like, oh, no, that's not true. I'm like, yes, it is, because Penn State fan, know Mike Parsons well. Yes, he can. He's done it. He can do that in the NFL. He would have been better off playing linebacker Sunday night than he would have been rushing the passer. And that's where the Eagles were able to – Shane Steichen and Nick Sirianni were able to outsmart Dan Quinn. You're right. It's You had him guessing. It's like, okay, you can't tee off. And he tees off best when the Cowboys are up. Well, the Cowboys were never up in that game. So he's got to be more, I, I should say, less aggressive. And I'm not going to say hard. That's kind of hard, Jeff, right? It's, yeah, yeah you're, it is. You're asking him to change his his basic instincts, you know, his you know the, the root of – his, 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 his play style, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, he can do it, but I wanted to get into Jack Driscoll, too. He only had three pressures when Lane Johnson left. You know only one went to Driscoll? Really? Because, yeah. I, you know, it's funny because I saw a stat, you know, there was a portion of that game where, you know, he had no pressures. Like, there was a, there was a, there was a long stretch where he had no pressures on Jalen Hurts. No, nothing. His – on the sack on Jalen Hurts in the third quarter – yeah, that was when he got his pressure on Driscoll, but he didn't finish there. I mean, that was really his biggest impact in that game outside of the whole penalty. Him and Trayvon Diggs did more penalty-wise than they actually did on the field, and you got to give credit to the Eagles for that, and I think Dallas has to find a way to counter that, but if I'm the Cowboys too, I'm probably just chalking it up and saying, you know what, they're a good football team. You know, we'll get off the snide against Detroit, Chicago, who they got coming up, so – that's the Cowboys there. Yeah, yeah real, real quickly, you brought up a good point about how the Eagles attacked their defense. The game plan clearly was to neutralize their best players on defense, and it worked. Trevon Diggs had a pretty quiet night. And Michael Parsons, same thing, a pretty a pretty quiet night. He had some pass deflections here and there. You know, he had, he had these flashes because, of course, he's a good player. Players like that, you don't stop them. You kind of redirect them. You know what I mean? So – Trevor Diggs, same thing. He was sort of redirected. I liked how Nick Sirianni and those guys 
put their put their skill position players in positions to take advantage of the weak points of their defense. You had so many people talking about, well, AJ Brown, you know, he didn't, you know, he didn't cook Trevon Diggs. That's not the point. The bottom line is the off the offensive play callers took advantage of your best players, neutralized them, and, put, and left them in no man's land where they couldn't impact the ball, where they couldn't impact the play. So, you know, I just want I just wanted to squeeze that in, man. I, I, I'm just so I was so, so, so fascinated by the way uh, Shane Steich and Nick, Nick Sirianni were calling plays and the way they were just being able to get these guys in space. Yeah, and, and you know what? You're right, too. And, and, and again, the Eagles were built to beat this football team. If you look at the way they constructed that roster, That's Gary a good point. Clay, James Bradbury, Hassan Reddick, uh, uh, A.J. Brown, they were built to beat the Cowboys. I mean, it, just, it all came to head Sunday night. They were built to beat that team. I, I wanted to get into this, too, before uh, we hit break. Washington's one thing I learned. They're going to see if their offense is actually better now with Carson Went- without Carson Wentz Powell actually benching him because Wentz had the finger injury. He's seeing a specialist. He's out minimum four weeks, so you're not going to see him week 11 against Philadelphia. He's not going to have the, the return to Lincoln Financial Field. They're going to see what they He's got. He's lucky. Today. He is lucky. <laughs> he really is. He really is. Or unlucky. Well, unlucky for him because he always gets hurt. But yeah, you're right. Overall, he is, I guess, lucky. But now they're going to see if, if it's actually a Wentz problem or if it's an offensive problem. I still think it's an offensive problem, too. Their offensive line ain't that good. But they're going to find out now through a fair evaluation with Taylor Heineke if it's more than Carson Wentz. Yeah. I mean, Taylor Heineke definitely knows how to run his offense, but if the offensive line is lackluster, it doesn't matter who you have back there, right? It begins and ends there. So if they can't block, you know, it's you're never going to really be able to see if this offense is the problem because they won't be able to block. Um, but what you will be able to see is you'll be able to see if the offensive line is the direct issue. You know, if the offensive line, you know, plays a fair game, maybe gives up maybe two or three sacks, maybe maybe four, Okay, you should still be able to, you know, weather through that. You know, I think the problem with Carson Wentz was the fact that the moment you got hands and feet on him, he started saying ghosts no matter what. You know what I mean? Like they're like every offensive line is not the Philadelphia Eagles, right? You know, you have some offensive lines that are better in in, in run blocking versus pass pro and vice versa. So it's important for this offensive line to be put in positions where they can succeed. Have the Washington Commanders offensive line been put in the best possible position to succeed? I don't think so. Because they had a quarterback that likes to hold the ball for four or five seconds and a lifetime. Because their their running backs haven't really been able to get off. You know what I mean? So it's it's a combination of things going over there, but you brought up a very good point. Is it Carson Wentz or is it simply just a bad team? And I'm I'm, I'm still pretty indifferent about that. Uh, I am too. And now you got Brian Robinson back. He made a significant impact Thursday night. Jahan Dawson's been pretty good for them. Uh, you still have Terry McLaurin. You still have Curtis Samuel. Uh, Man, and I feel bad for Terry. Be healthy. I feel bad for Terry. Yeah. Like, so like it, they're, they're an interesting team. I, I'm just going to say that. It's going to be an interesting four to six weeks with Washington. And, and look, they're still in it. They're not in the NFC East race, but they're still in the playoff race here at two and four. Right. So, yeah, you know, uh, have we got Ryan in yet? Uh, Ryan hasn't gotten here yet, um, but but he did he, he did get my email, so he should uh, he should be on his way uh, any minute. But you know, my, you know my final thoughts about the Commanders. They've they were thought to be maybe the second or third best team in this division before the season started. You know, everyone was saying Carson Wentz. I mean, not Carson Wentz, but Jalen Hurts is probably probably the third best quarterback in this division. You know, they were saying Carson Wentz is going to is going to go crazy with these weapons. Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dotson. You know, everyone was saying that. You know, the Cowboys will be the team to beat, which they are because they they led they they were the king to the division. I think I think as of right now, the Eagles are clearly the better the better team in the division. And like you said earlier, they had to beat Dallas. That's 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 what they needed to do. And you know, I think. The NFC East is in a very good position in the long term. Um, so far, the coaching seems to be pretty, pretty good. You know, in three out, in three out of the four teams, um, all for some line play is starting to um, starting to become a regular, a regular occurrence. Good offensive line play is starting to be a regular occurrence. 
you know, the Giants offensive line is starting to step up a little more. Cowboys offensive line is, you know, standing, standing pat, even though they had some injuries over there. Philadelphia Eagles offensive line is doing what the Philadelphia Eagles offensive line always does. So, you know, this is, you know, this is a good year for the NFC East. And ultimately, you know, we're going to see how this thing pans out in the long term. I do think the Giants taper off. I think they, I think they will start to plateau in a bit. Um, I think the Cowboys, we still have yet to see how, what they look like in, in you know, in tip top shape. Again, I think Dak is still going to have limitations. And then this Philadelphia Eagles team, man, they have yet to play their best game of football, in my opinion. I feel like I feel like we've yet to see that game where we say, you know what, top to bottom, they were, they 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 did it all. They checked every box, you know. But you know, different games call for different results and you know uh, different um pre prerequisites. So, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited for what this Eagles team is going to do, and it's so much more to discuss. Yeah, exactly, and. Eagles fans, buckle up. We're not going to get that much Eagles football over the next couple weeks here, if you think about it. So you got the bye this week, right? And you got Pittsburgh. And you got Houston four days later. And you got 11 days until they play Washington. So really, you're getting two two games in a stretch of like five days, and then that's it, pretty much. It's almost like you get a reprieve from the Eagles. It, it's like, okay, the first half of the season's over. You got you got that stretch. Now you got six hundred. Then you got this like middle part here. You know, and everybody's expecting for the Eagles to go two and zero in that stretch, and then you got the means of the schedule: Washington, Indianapolis. I, I look, I'm, I'm adding Washington there because that that is the start of that means of the schedule: Washington, Indianapolis, Green Bay, Tennessee, the Giants, the Bears, the Cowboys, the Saints, the Giants. I mean, it's, it's a pretty it's a pretty favorable stretch of game for sure, my man. Most definitely, it, but we we'll got see. our guy Ryan Rothstein. Um, backstage, we're going to hop on. So, you know, let's hit this break. You guys are locked in on Good Morning, NFC East. He's Jeff Kerr. I'm your guy, Tone the Second. Keep it locked, you guys. Stay tuned. <laughs> 